Welcome, everyone. My name is Maya Jakimowicz. Um, I'm Vice President for Evidence-Based Policy Implementation at Results for America. And I want to begin by thanking uh, the Aspen Institute Center for Urban Innovation for co-hosting this event with us. I also want to thank the Lauren John Arnold Foundation for their generous support of Results for America's Local Government Fellowship Program, without which none of this would be possible. Um, here in the room, we have a wonderful collection of government leaders representatives from community-based organizations, and participants from national research and policy organizations. Thank you all for joining us. I want to acknowledge in particular the Results for America's 16 local government fellows who are here in the room with us. They're celebrating the culmination of their two-year fellowship program, which is focused on the use of data and evidence to make better, more consistent policy and budget decisions. Um, and the local government leaders that participate in this fellowship program are true rock stars, and we celebrate you and the hard work that you do every day to improve outcomes for the residents that you serve. Um, we also, I'm so happy to say that we have 16 Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute fellows. They're part of an emerging Latino leadership program. Um, thank you for being here. We welcome you to this conversation. Um, today, as part of this event, Results for America is releasing this report on local government's use of evidence in policy making. This report summarizes so much of the accomplishments and lessons learned as part of the Local Government Fellowship Program. We're really proud of the work that the fellows have been able to do, and we encourage you to read it and contact us if you have any questions or want to talk further about it. And we're so thrilled to have a distinguished panel of mayors here today to tell us their secrets. Um, for transforming local government. I want to note there's a slight modification to the agenda. As many of you know, Salt Lake Mayor Ben McAdams is running um, to represent Utah's fourth congressional district, and the results of Tuesday's elections were quite close, um, and so a final winner has not yet been announced, at least not th until this morning when I last checked. So for this reason, Mayor McAdams is not with us. Um, Nevertheless, we're so excited to have Baltimore Mayor Catherine Pugh and Tulsa Mayor G.T. Bynum here with us to talk about their work. Um, 
Before, before we do, I'm so pleased to introduce Melody Barnes. Um, Melody is the co-director for policy and public affairs at the Democracy Initiative. This is a new initiative out of the University of Virginia. It's interdisciplinary teaching, research, and engagement effort. Uh, Melody also serves as the chair of the Aspen Institute Forum for Community Solutions and Opportunity Youth Forum. And she's also a much loved senior fellow with Results for America. Uh, Melody previously served as director of the White House Policy uh, Domestic Policy Council under President Barack Obama. Um, and prior to that, Melody was the executive vice president for policy at the Center for American Progress. She also served as chief counsel to the late Senator um, Edward Kennedy in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And she's held many other important roles um, in her career in, in public service and in public policy. So please join me in welcoming Melody to the podium. Well, good morning, everyone. It is fantastic to see so many people in one room excited about data and evidence. Um, this is really fantastic, and, and early, too. So thank you so much for being here. And Maya, thank you for that introduction. I am also thrilled to be here with all of you to celebrate the work of RFA's local government fellows. I don't have to tell you all, this is not a time when government is always held in high esteem. Um, and because of that, at this particular moment, to have a group of people whose work, whose day-to-day -day focus and mission is one that celebrates the altruistic reason that so many of us have served or do serve in government, it's really wonderful to celebrate their work. And the fact that because every day they get up and they focus on what will allow us to do work in government that in turn makes other people's lives better. How can we be more effective so other people have the opportunities they deserve and they can fulfill their potential? That, I think, is something that is worth celebrating. I also want to focus on the fact that their work and what so many of you are doing in your hometowns is important because you know that data and evidence are essential that they, data and evidence can turn lives around, they can make government work more efficiently, they can lead to an understanding and a concept of government that people can celebrate. So for that, not only is what you're doing important at home, but what you're doing is also important to our democracy. So yes, you should think about it in those lofty terms. And in thinking about that, I do want to, for a moment, focus on both the work of Mayor Bynum and Mayor Pugh. But I want to start out with a story about Mayor Bynum that I think is particularly relevant when we are just a few days away from the midterm elections. Um, when Mayor Bynum was running for election, he was demonized as one who aligned himself with, had spent time with Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, which I can say is not so bad, but I can understand, <laughs> you know, if you're running, you're a Republican, running in Tulsa might be a little bit challenging. Um, he was also defined as someone who, you know, was consorted with the most liberal labor union in America, the AFL-CIO. I mean, it's getting worse and worse and worse for you out there, and you're running for re-election. When, in fact, he had the endorsement of the firefighters union, which is not the same as the AFL. Um, and he had not been doing campaign stops with either Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama. The way that Mayor Bynum turned his race around, the way that he went about speaking to the constitu his uh, constituents in Tulsa, was to do something that I think would be a surprise to most people. He did something that got people at the edge of their seat. He did something that made people think about him and what was possible in a whole new way. He talked about data and evidence. I know, I know, I heard the snickering. Um, but that's what he did, because he recognized that this was a way that he could speak to the most important problems and challenges facing the people of Tulsa, and to let them know that his work, his efforts, were going to make their lives different and to make their lives better. He encouraged them to hold him accountable 
on the issues that mattered. Better education for their children, per capita income growth in their community, and also managing the growth of Tulsa. And in turn, by doing that, he was able to win by 17 points. Think about that. The tough, ugly elections that we've seen over and over, but data and evidence being the shining knight that rides in and can turn elections around. I think, for, first of all, for any of you that are run, thinking about running for office, remember data and evidence are your friend. Um, but for all of us, I think it's important to understand that his strategy worked because the focus on data and evidence works. We know that data-driven programs can help turn around our education systems. They can help us to improve health outcomes. They can ensure that re-entering citizens are able to access employment and have and live better lives. They can make sure that every child is attaining the kind of outcomes that they deserve when they go to school every single day. Uh, several years ago, uh, a few of us contributed to an edited volume called Moneyball for Government. How many of you have seen or read Moneyball for Government? Okay, that's great. I can tell you two things about that, well, three things. One, I'm proud of that work. Two, I gave a copy to many of my family members for Christmas. <laughs> and <laughs> my husband's, one of my husband's aunts said, and she confessed and told me, she's like, Oh, I love Melody so much. She thinks this is really interesting. Um, <laughs> and I see Michelle Jolin back there. We were at a book party. Uh, my husband and I hosted a book party um, when the book came out. And a former member of Congress, Congress said, so you made this a bestseller. Hmm. But in fact, that is true, because Moneyball pointed to several things that are important about data and evidence. And they provide a path for public officials who are trying to use data to improve outcomes in their communities. One, the fact that you've got to build an evidence base. We have to have the infrastructure, the architecture necessary to collect data and information and to support evidence-based programming. Two, that once you've got that evidence, that it's important to invest money in what works. Which leads to the third thing, which means that we have to direct resources toward what works and away from those things that don't. And that can be challenging, but at the end of the day, that's what's going to get us the outcomes that we want. And to that end, I want to also talk about now, now um, Mayor Catherine Pugh. And Mayor Pugh is someone that I have watched and admired for quite some time for many, many things that she's done. So it's wonderful to be back in the room with her today. And she has launched two evidence-based programs um, that deal with public safety in Baltimore. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I know that um, you may do so during the panel, but I do want to talk a little bit about one of them. Um, because A, it's brought a new focus and an intensified focus to her efforts to address issues of public safety in Baltimore. And two, because the Republican governor has also invested in that programming um, in her city. And one of them, those programs is called ROCA, which is also a program that is supported by RFA. And ROCA is an effort to engage with those young people in the city of Baltimore that have the highest propensity to and have been involved in the juvenile justice system or the justice system in some way in an effort to try and break the cycle of violence in the city of Baltimore. And ROCA was recruited to Baltimore with a four-year, $17 million package um, with the idea of setting goals and standards around public safety and going into the streets, literally, in East and West Baltimore and knocking on doors, not to harass those young people, but to build relationships with them. And as the founder of ROCA, Molly Baldwin says, data has been key in getting that work done in understanding the behavior of the young men involved in that program, but also analyzing the work that her staff is doing so that they can do their jobs better. In doing that, they have tracked their work in many different ways. One, how many times they're knocking on a door or making a call. Two, looking at the number of consecutive days that the young men involved in the program have shown up. 
Three, how often are they getting a raise and a promotion? And four, when and for how long they may relapse? In all of these different ways and others, they're getting a better understanding of what's working in that program, and it's an iterative process. How do we change it? How do we make it work better? This year, there's a hope that there will be 100 young men that will participate in that program, young men between the ages of 16 and 24. And for those of us who do that kind of work, we know that those are some of the most vulnerable young adults that we have in the country, but their lives can be turned around. And I can tell you from personal experience, the work that we do here at Aspen, that they can become contributing members of society, active, in, active civically, raise families, hold jobs, isn't that so much better than the alternative? And that's the kind of work that Mayor Pugh is doing in Baltimore. Now back to Mayor Bynum for a second. I know that one of the things that he's done is open an office of performance strategy and innovation in Tulsa. And that's been an effort to try and align the goals and the strategies that they have um, for change in Tulsa and also to open the door to greater innovation. And so I commend you for that work, doing the hard work and to get it right, but at the same time, finding ways to think more, create, more creatively and using data and evidence to do so. They've got a dashboard that they've put in place that allows them to understand where they are in the process, but also to communicate more, more honestly, more transparently with the public. And that dashboard covers everything from things like community policing, police staffing, animal welfare, the condition of the pavement. And I can say for any woman in here, when you've walked down pavement and your heel gets caught in that <laughs> crook, you are deeply appreciative of that work. But it's good, you know, in all seriousness, for basic safety, to make it easier for those with disabilities and for other reason reasons. Coming to that soon will be 311 customer care and also um, a dashboard focused on their 911 services. So the work that Mayor Bynum and that Mayor Pugh are doing are tra is transformative. At the same time, we know as we do this work collectively that we have to think about it holistically. The data and evidence isn't a green eye shade idea as apparently my aunt in Canada believes it is. It is also, we also have to do it in a way that engages the community. And uh, several years ago, working with RFA, my co-author Paul Schmitz and I developed uh, an article, wrote an article for the Stanford Social Innovation Review when we talk about the relationship between data and evidence and community engagement. Two things that people used to think were divergent, didn't have any relationship with one another, and in fact could be at odds with one another, to point out the fact that in fact they have to coexist. You are only setting yourself up for failure if you don't engage the community and work with the community on the front end. And what we talked about were a few different things. One, that you've got to or organize for ownership. You've got to bring people together at the front end, engage them and bring them to the table to think with you um, about the problems and what the solutions are and how to use d data and evidence, including the data and evidence that is their everyday life. Secondly, that you have to allow for complexity, understanding the culture of the environment in which you're working. When you're going to East and West Baltimore, you've got to understand who's there and what's happened if you're going to get that work right and you're going to use data effectively. Third, you've got to work with local institutions in doing that. You also have to apply an equity lens. Again, this is getting people in the community at the table with you, not presenting something that's fully baked and saying, here you are, and potentially inviting their rejection of the idea. It's also important to build momentum. And I, we refer to this as patient urgency, which people I've met all over the country say, patient urgency is a really difficult thing. Uh, and it is. but. Uh, and my husband, who's here in the back, and he may be grimacing as I use a basketball metaphor. <laughs> but I think of this in the great words of the great coach, John Wooden, who was also a poet, be quick, but don't hurry. You know, if you want to get to the basket, you've got to make sure that the screen is set before you try and shoot the basket, or else you may, may not get that opportunity. The same thing here. 
we have to make sure that we've got all of the right elements in place before we move forward. And we all know that we want to get to those answers very quickly, but unless we've got some element of patience and we've got every, all people in the right place and everything aligned appropriately, we're going to miss the shot. And finally, that we have to think about how we manage our constituents through change. Some of this is very difficult when we bring data and evidence to the table, but working closely and in alignment with people in the community, we can do a better job of it. So in closing, I will say once again, what you all are doing and the fact that we are gathered in this room is so, so important. We can look at the work of these two great leaders and others and know that we've got a path that's been illuminated to use data and evidence more effectively and to do it in a way that we are bringing our constituents to the table um, as we do so. What's happening on the federal level is important, but if we are going to navigate the difficult waters ahead of us, if we're going to make the changes that are necessary to improve people's lives, we have to bring data and evidence to the table to do so. And in doing that, we can change lives, we can win elections, and we can uphold, I think, some of the, the most fundamental aspects of our democracy. So thank you for being here with us today, and I'm excited to listen to the next panel. Thank you. So thanks again, everyone. I am Jennifer Bradley. I'm the director of the Center for Urban Innovation at the Aspen Institute. I am grateful to Results for America for sharing this opportunity with us to celebrate uh, the local government fellows, to give a stage to these innovative mayors who are doing great work, um, and to hear from Melody Barnes, who bridges both of our organizations. So I'm going to welcome uh, Mayor Pugh first, Mayor Catherine Pugh of Baltimore, to the stage. And Mayor, Mayor G.T. Bynum from Tulsa. So Mayor Pugh, I'll start with you. Uh, Melody mentioned some of the programs that, that you've done based on evidence and data in Baltimore. What's one that you think is working particularly well that you want to share with the audience today? So let me just say first a uh, shout out to Bob Cinnamon, who is uh, one of our fellows, our budget director in Baltimore. We expect great things. He's a great budget director. The programs that Melanie mentioned are programs that we're just now setting up. So, and we set them up based on data. And ROCA is one of those, as well as Safe Streets. But what I really would like to talk about is why we set up the Violence Reduction Initiative, which was based on data that we collected. You know, one of my big priorities is reducing violence in the city of Baltimore. And so what we learned from our data was that there's a lot of agencies that impact violence reduction, whether it is Department of Public Works, Recreation and Parks, Housing, all of those entities play a role. But what we realized was that everybody was operating in their own silos. Mm -hmm. So the idea that I had was to bring everybody together in one room with our command staff of our police department. Because they would say in conversations that it's difficult, for one thing, to get a light fixed, to get an alley clean, to get a, a house boarded up where drugs might be being stored. And what we learned in the data, because we knew where the crime was occurring based on the data collection that we have every day, was that these agencies were significant to helping us to reduce violence. And I think one of the lessons that we learned early on was that people who operate in silos and don't know each other interact differently. And if you give them a period of time in which they begin to interact, the relationships are strengthened. And the goal that you're trying to seek is quickly um, you, you're able to accomplish it. And again, I think that that initiative, which is also being studied by other cities and entities, because as has been said to me, that's not been done before. But at the same time, we've seen the relationships develop, and it's also impacted the reduction of violence in our city. Great. Mayor Bynum, do you want to give a little more detail about one of your evidence-driven uh, initiatives as well? Sure, and I'm going to follow Mayor Pugh's lead, though, and give a shout out to James Wagner, <laughs> well, you kind of chief have of performance to strategy and innovation, who's making it happen. <laughs> and also to all the local uh, government fellows. Uh, that, that's how I got started on this path, was I went through that program with Maya and Miguel, 
great to see you. Um, and as a city councilor, was frustrated that uh, I couldn't get the administration at the time to act on all these things that I was learning going through the program, and so decided best way to do it would be to be the mayor myself. Um, uh, one program that we've done, and really it was trying to take that experience that I had in the fellowship program, but bring it down to a local level, we created a, a civic innovation fellowship in Tulsa, and we just put out for half a dozen local citizens who would be interested in learning more about how to utilize data to help city operations uh, and had a ton of people apply, which I think speaks to a maybe overlooked desire in communities for people to play a part utilizing this kind of innovation. Um, but we have six people and we asked them to look at one issue that every city deals with, which is code violations and code enforcement. We deal with in Tulsa about 7,000 uh, reported violations a year. Of those, about uh, a third end up where the city actually has to take action, uh, remediate the property, and then either fine the property owner or put a lien on the property. So that's so, over so 2,000 of these a you're year. You're talking about sort of safety code, how people use their property. Exactly, the yes. And so our Civic Innovation Fellows started looking at all of those and really did a deep dive on well, who owns these properties? Uh, how are they using them? Uh, and really broke out all these violators into different categories, whether it was homeowner, landlords, uh, frequent flyers, if you will. And what they found was uh, about uh, two thirds uh, of the violators that we had were uh, non-occupant owners, so landlords. and. So what we are now doing is recognizing that the way in the past that we would notify people of a code violation was we'd put something in, in the mail and then we'd go post something on the property. Well, if you don't own, you know, if you're not living in the property every day, you never see that sign, uh, maybe you get something in the mail. But what we started doing and are doing is setting up a text message notification to increase our ability to notify landlords as soon as we receive the violation notification, even before we send an inspector out there. So they have the ability to proactively address it. In a, in a different random controlled trial that we did at the city, we found that when you text message someone versus just doing something through the mail, we have about a 15% increase in compliance. Uh, and so it's going to be really exciting over the next year or so to see if we can improve on the compliance of landlords in Tulsa and maintaining their properties better than they have. Okay. Um, that, the, the note about texting, of course, right? Because <coughs> all no, nobody is tempted to run to their mailbox in the middle of this uh, panel. Right. And everybody's like, what's, what's going on with my text? So exactly. uh, well done. It, you, you had something to, to add into that? Yeah, I was going to say that I think one of the things is important is as you're collecting this data, is that you set up solutions and, and that you measure. Because we did similar, we created the office of, because I think most people know Baltimore has always been sort of data driven when we had city stats. And so what we created was city stat smart, sustainable solutions. So while we're collecting the data, we're always, we're always looking at, so what solutions can you come to and how do you measure the effectiveness of the solutions that you, you set in terms of goals? And we, for example, found in the violence reduction initiative that there were issues like uh, responding to housing violations that took mm -hmm. seven to 14 days, where we now have them down to two days, or boarding up houses took 14 to 30 days, which we now have down to three or four days. So that kind of response was important to the community because this was evidence that we got from neighbors and communities saying, well, why is this house boarded up? What are your plans for it? So creating, collecting the data is one thing, but the other thing is to create the sustainable solutions yep. as you've been able to do as well. So it seems like using data and evidence, because you, you're able to turn on and tell these stories. It used to take us 14 days to deal with the boarded mm -hmm. up house. Now it's down to two days. Um, we're going after the code violators. So why doesn't everybody do it? It seems like such a no-brainer. <laughs> uh, what have been some, you can, I, you can approach this question in two ways. Why don't more people do it? Or what have been some of the obstacles to, to doing it in Tulsa? Well, I'll say, first of all, when I went through the fellowship program, I went back all fired up and charged up, ready to do this, and started visiting with people in our business community saying, you know what we want to do at the city is 
invest in the things that are proving results and take money away from the things that aren't. And every business owner I talked to was like, that's adorable that you guys finally got on that. <laughs> We've been doing that for the entire history of business. Um, but I think that speaks to the fact that it is a fairly new trend when it comes to government and especially in local government. What we've encountered is that, yes, we were collecting, and I think every city collects mountains of data, and that's the opportunity that's there. But it's not necessarily collected in data sets that are designed to be proactively utilized. They're collected for auditing purposes. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a good example, our, our police records management system in Tulsa is older than I am. Uh, it was designed by our in-house software engineers in 1974. The Apple computer in 1974 was a wooden box. Okay. Uh, and so we have to find, you have to find ways of taking various data sets. The example I gave a minute ago about what we're trying to do around code enforcement. You're having to pull together code enforcement information, property owner information, all these different data sets that are being collected by different groups and merge it into one form that people can use. I'd say the other challenge is that you have to find ways of <clears throat> making the people who are working closest to the problem comfortable with using data. I mean, at the city of Tulsa, you know, most of our department heads, and I imagine this is similar for most cities, these are going to be people who've worked in your city organization for decades without using this approach. They aren't necessarily trained in data analysis or how to use it proactively because it's a new field. And so James and his team have had to work very closely with helping guide our leadership at the city into a greater level of comfort in utilizing data proactively. And I'd say that's the technical nature of it is a challenge, but the greatest challenge is that cultural shift and an increasing level of comfort with utilizing data to make decisions. Yeah, Mayor Pugh, what have you found? Yeah, we found pretty much the same thing when we set up the Office of um, City Stats Sustainable mm -hmm. Solutions because what we said to all of our city agencies is that we, we're measuring for success, we're measuring for outcomes, and so this data is important. I think it is a cultural shift. But I, I do think that leadership does matter mm -hmm. in terms of making this a priority. But the other side of that is that many of the solutions are not affordable, at least by city <laughs> government in right. many cases. But what I can tell you that having that data really is a way to increase the participation of the private sector. Mm -hmm. And I'll take Roker, for example. When Roker was first in introduced to us, the data was evidence. I mean, it, it showed you what a program like this could do. And the city itself could not finance it alone. And so we had gone to the state initially asking for support for this program. And initially, we didn't get the support from the state. So what we did was, um, I, I remember meeting with the Greater Baltimore Committee, which is our arm of business folks in the community. And what they said to me was, you know, we really need you to understand how important it is to reduce violence in the city. And we need you to understand what it is you need to do, and we need you and I looked and I said, hmm. I said, well, and then he said, well, let's start this meeting. I said, well, why don't I start? Because I have a presentation supported by data that will show you where you, where you were, where we are, and where we need to go. And at the end of my presentation, I have an ask. And the ask was for $10 million to jumpstart ROCA and to improve on safe streets, all of which were evidence-based by and supported by data. And I can tell you that after my hour and some odd 20 minute meeting, I walked out of the room with six million and the additional four million came by the end of the week. Wow. And so that's what data can help you do. It supports uh, what you believe to be <laughs> We just walked out of here with a million dollar idea. <laughs> right. <Let's say> it. <laughs> but it, it, it works. I mean, um, it is hard to deny data. And I can tell you just another yes. simple example of that. And I'm sure in different cities you have different examples of it. In Baltimore City, one of the issues we have on the streets of our city, one that has been there since the 1980s, are young people with squeegees. Mm. Uh, does everybody know what those are? Yeah. The little squeegee things that run up to your car and, and uh, want to wash your windows. And so uh, last year, a team of folks in my office decided we really wanted to address this issue. Because now they're called Pew's kids. You know, I don't have any children, but you know, they're, the city's, they're the city's children. And so every time somebody is squeegeeing on the corner, you know, people want to call up the city. You got to do something about it. Police need to arrest them. All of these things. So last year, in an effort to take a look at this 
and using data. Uh, we estimated it was something like close to about 100 children somewhere, and some of them are older men around the city doing this thing, impeding traffic. And so <laughs> I, one of the conversations I said, let's be real clear about who's on the corner. You know, you got the paper boy, the, the, uh, the person who's selling bean pies, uh, the, the person who has a sign. The difference is the reaction and the response. You know, the guy selling bean pie is not going to throw his bean pie at you if you say no. And the person who is selling newspaper is not going to throw the newspaper at you. Or, or the person even so, sign, holding the sign might spit, but he'll probably spit on the ground and not at <laughs> you. The difference is the anger levels that develop in some of these young people because you're not going to give them money. And so what we did was we collected about, or helped, to get about 31 young people off of the corner. And we said we wanted to meet with them. We met with them. We enrolled them in our Youth Works program, which is a program that we raise about $20 million, mostly privately, every year to put young people to work. And, so, and then we asked questions, and we collected the information. So now I get to say to the business community, who calls me all the time about the squeegee, young people who are in the corner. We have data, data that shows that if you don't create sustainable solutions, it doesn't work. You know, you can't take children off to the corner and give them a summer job. You can't do like what we did, pop-up car washes, where seven young people were really excited to do it uh, because it was replacing the income that day while they were on the corner. But if you can't pop it up today and then pop it up tomorrow, it doesn't work. So what we did was, you know, collected the data, and then said, OK, so now here's the cost of moving these folks off the corner. And I'm sure that when we take that 100 off, another 100 will come. But this is the reality of what you're facing. And we were able to say that a percentage of those young people were homeless. So we were able to deal with the homeless issues around them. A percentage of those children were dropouts. So we were able to push them towards an education. Uh, some of, uh, another percentage of those young people actually could go into the job market but did not know how to get to the job market, so we were able to assist them. And then there's a percentage of them that have social issues, whether it's drug addiction, mental health issues, that deserve wraparound services and counseling and all those other things. And so when I finished uh, collecting the data, we took and sat down with a group of finance people and said, okay, so what does this mean? What does it cost? And so I could say to the business community, this is going to cost you about $2 million a year if you really want to focus on the people who are on the corners and how you assist them from getting from off the corner into something that's productive and meaningful. So again, collecting that data is so important. And I think people were really shocked that we actually spent time having conversations, collecting data, and recording the data, and then preparing what we consider to be a sustainable solution. So I had the advantage of interviewing both of you for short video clips. Um, earlier today, and one of the things that you both talked about was how using data, which some people might think of as you know very cold or off-putting, or as Melody said, the opposite of engaging with people on a human level, has actually had a wonderful transformative effect, either in the relationship between city employees or the relationship between city employees and residents, or both. So Mayor Bynum, can you talk a little bit about, about that, how data has kind of helped people be a little more human? Oh, sure. I mean, we've seen it both within City Hall, but then also in the broader community. So within City Hall, I think the clearest difference we've seen is that we created a program, uh, and this kind of goes back to the point, it, it's a lot of it is, you know, President Obama has this this point he, he makes about how it's not just about having the facts, but it's about the story you tell with those facts. And so we created a program we called the Urban Data Pioneers. Uh, we didn't call it the City Data Analysis Group. Uh, <laughs> and so that, and the purpose of it was that any city employees that wanted to help us uh, utilize data better and analyze problems and any community volunteers that wanted to play a part could meet independently and we would create these cohorts because we realized there were so many problems in the city that we could apply data to and we just could not hire enough people to deal with all of these or to analyze them, let alone come up with solutions. And so we created the Urban Data Pioneers. I thought maybe we'd have a dozen people show up. We had 60 people show up to the first meeting, ended up having over 200 people participate. Uh, right now, a majority of those people are not city employees. They're community volunteers who work in banks and hospitals and energy companies, aerospace companies, 
who have this really unique skill around data analysis, and yet no one was coming to them asking them to use that skill to improve the community. Everybody always thinks to go to the Philanthropic Foundation or the United Way, but people don't think that these data analysts that are right there in your community have these skills that can help you magnify your ability to do good. And so we brought those groups together, and I would say the value of that one is it plugged more citizens into problem solving at the city in ways that they hadn't been before. But the unintended benefit of it within our organization at the city is that it really flattened the structure. Again, kind of back to my earlier point, in the past you would have on problem solving, you might have the mayor working with department heads and city councilors, but you're talking about a couple dozen people trying to solve a problem, and the other 3,575 people that work at the city would just get to hear what the solution was and execute on it. Well now, any city employee that wants to play a part in solving a particular problem has the ability to do so, whether they've worked there for 40 years or 40 days. And that has really flattened the structure within our organization. It's, been, it's enabled us to identify some really bright lights within the overall organization that we can utilize better than just having them in their silo that they would have been in otherwise. The other really, uh, I think, powerful element of it that I underestimated, uh, I was initially focused on it from a performance and efficiency standpoint. I did not appreciate going into it, but I do now, the ability that data has as a vehicle to bring people together who are of very disparate political beliefs otherwise, to be able to focus on one problem at one time and work together to solve it. And so we've utilized that really as a community builder in Tulsa. Uh, you know, there's so much philosophical disagreement and partisan disagreement, but when you can give people clear data that shows what a problem is, what different solutions might be, and how those solutions perform in addressing that problem, you take a lot of that hot air out of the discussion and you allow people who otherwise would be yelling at each other and fighting on social media to just sit down and help fix the greatest challenges in your community. And so it's a very powerful tool in that regard as well. Yeah, Mayor Pugh, you, you had found something similar in, in yeah. city government, yeah. certainly. Two quick things. One uh, was the, the initial bringing together of the, of, they weren't the department heads. We asked each department head to send us an executive that was really going to be responsible and don't send us anyone who did not have the power to act. Mm. And so, um, the command staff of the police department, all of these uh, empowered to act folks who probably had not been as empowered before, yeah, in the room, listening, and then trying to solve the problems on a daily basis, and that's what I really liked about it. And who, it was Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, Mr. Smith, Mr. Jones, Ms. Susie, I mean, everybody was initially called by their first name. Now it's Toby and Jack and John and, and Helen, whoever, because I never get one person saying to me that, you know, I was going to retire, but this is the best thing that I get to do every single day because they get to see the results of their work and they get to hear it every day. And then one other quick one was when we did Work Baltimore last year. And um, the woman who worked on this was so data driven. And the number of people that she engaged in the process, everything from the private sector helping to promote, the uh, community who could put together the closet for people who couldn't afford to come to an interview, the volunteers who worked on doing conversations with folks and resume writing, and resulted in over 31 volunteer workshops across the city with, with different groups, organizations, and individuals participating everything geared towards getting people to come out and interview for jobs. And then 3,000 some odd people registered online, which was interesting, nearly about 2,500 actually walked through the door on that day. And then to take the, and then they collected data. And data that showed that uh, while everybody didn't get a job, there were some concerns that needed to be met. So for example, this year, about 30 lawyers volunteered to do um, expungement of records because that was something mm. that came out in the data collection. So it was a way to involve folks from around the community and everybody was just so enthusiastic about the work. One of the things that you mentioned as being important is creating an office, right? So there is a kind of focus of, of power 
uh, people who can get things done. Say a little bit more about the importance of making this an office in city government to think about data and evidence. Well, it was interesting. I met this um, young woman, Kendra Parlock, who is a data scientist. And um, her husband and her used to do this little streetscape event every year. And I would ride by, and I was just having this conversation. And she was headed to her job in New York. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> and she was telling me that she collects data, and data really is important to driving solutions. And I was like, wow, you know, we have a city stat office, and we were looking for someone. So she came in, and then she said, but I want to be more than just collecting data. I want to be about solutions. And so she has a whole team of folks who not only collect the data from the various agencies, but they also drive solutions based on conversations, working with different groups, whether it's in the community or at the city level. But every, every agency is measured in terms of what they're doing. For example, I never forget a conversation with our housing guy. And I said, so how many houses are you going to take down? And he said, uh, 400. I said, 400? 400 times 40, we have 16. That'll be 40 years. Are you serious? <laughs> I said, you have to have a goal of 4,000 a year, and which is what he's, his goal is now. But that's based on what we know. That's data that we have. And so, yes, it's important to have that office, but it's also important to be able to get people in and, as I think you pointed out, change the cultural behavior of those who are in these key positions that can drive performance. Mm -hmm. Mayor Bonham, what's, what's been your experience? Because you, you've talked about needing more people than are your official data and evidence people. But yes. why, why, why then do you need to centralize it and have that statement of, a, of an office? Well, when I went through the program, I really identified several cities around the country that I thought were just doing remarkable work on this front, Baltimore being one of those, uh, Philly uh, and Louisville. Uh, those would probably be our three big models uh, that we wanted to replicate. And so we assembled our office really trying to, to reflect what those groups had accomplished in those cities, uh, ripping off their good ideas. That's, great. <laughs> um, That's what we should do. The value of it for us, I think, has been, and this applies to anything you do in city government, you can have all the good intention in the world, but if you don't have somebody or a group of people who show up every day whose job it is to execute on that, it won't happen. There, there's just too many things that fly by you every day. There's always a new fire to put out, always something else that needs to be addressed. And so if you don't have a group of individuals who are focused on working on that every day, it won't happen. Especially when you're trying to do something that is a fundamental cultural shift within a large bureaucracy. Uh, and so creating the office for us, I mean, we have three people. Uh, and we operated most of last year with two people. Uh, we just hired a new data analyst uh, to be on our team. But what they're able to do is keep beating that drum, identify other uh, allies within the organization who want to play a part in utilizing data, and, and that helps kind of spread the fire, if you will. They're able to identify whether that's in our, I can think of people in our fire department or our code enforcement department, who may not be the department head, but they have the ability to keep working on this and then help spread the enthusiasm within their own organization. And that's how you bring the culture around. The other thing that James and his team have done so well, though, is giving anybody in the community who wants to play a part in doing this the chance to do so. I think so often government at any level uh, is viewed, it can be viewed as sort of separate and apart from the citizens. Uh, and citizens can't necessarily feel like they get to, to play a role. You know, Gavin Newsom wrote this book a couple years ago called Citizen Villain, made the analogy about how for a lot of citizens, government is like a vending machine where you just put money in and hopefully the thing you want falls down. <laughs> um, but what we want it to be is something where a community is playing a part in building the city that they want it to be. And this office does a great job of utilizing just a handful of people to really magnify that impact citywide. Okay. See, I think the other thing is the, it's not just having the office. It's allowing, like we created an innovation fund mm -hmm. that every agency can apply to do something innovative in the city, which I think is great. And then the other thing that I really love is what general services does. Our general services department uh, has a cost savings sharing based on data 
and their ability to save the city money. And I was shocked because um, I got to distribute the checks to the general services employees who each got a check for almost 800 and some dollars because of the work that they were, the money they were able to mm -hmm. save the city based on how they, their department operates and how they utilize data and so forth to be successful at their work. And I think those kinds of things as we continue to move forward with city government, looking at how businesses operate, you know, because I always look at, at Baltimore as a $3.9 billion business operation. And so how we spend our money, how we distribute our money, how we drive ourselves towards real solutions, I think impacts all of the citizens. So it's been, uh, it's been really interesting watching how folks will jump in and be creative and also really look at how do they drive solutions for government themselves. And I want to add to that. We are, those of us who work in the city space right now are incredibly lucky to be working in it at a time when I don't think there's ever been greater national interest from a philanthropic foundation nonprofit side in helping cities operate effectively. My grandfather was mayor back in the 1970s, and he was just happy to go to the US Conference of Mayors once a year. Uh, now, there's so much collaboration between mayors uh, across the country and support for what mayors are doing from a lot of important organizations, including the two today, uh, that is helping us do such a better job and access so many better ideas than we would have had available to us in the past. So does data give you kind of a common language? Is it easier, do you think, for you, Mayor Bynum, to look at what Mayor Pugh does and say, that, I'm going to do that, because there's data than it would have been for your grandfather exactly. to uh, speak to one of Mayor, the mayor's predecessors and say, because it's just, you've got, you've got the same language. No, I think that's exactly right, because you know, I'll give you a, a great example. Uh, Albuquerque uh, created this program called the Better Way Program. They pioneered it there, Mayor Barry did, and the idea was that they send a van out uh, every morning and they drive around and look for people who are panhandling. They offer them an honest day's work for an honest day's pay rather than panhandling. Uh, almost everybody that they have approached takes them up on it. They go out and clean up public spaces, clean up parks, stuff like that. And in the middle of the day, they offer them social service assistance. Social service workers come in to interview them. Uh, and they had remarkable success in, in really helping people give them a hand up and get them off the street. And so we have been testing that exact same model in Tulsa now for the last six months. And what's fascinating is our results in Tulsa are almost exactly the same as what they saw in their first six months in Albuquerque. And so that has tremendous importance for cities all around the country because all of a sudden you have two different cities in two different parts of the United States who have tried this program and received similar results. Mm -hmm. And that means other cities can expect to have similar results, hopefully, uh, by utilizing this program and you're then serving the people most in need in communities all around the country better. It makes cities laboratories of democracy, if you will, like we haven't ever been before. And I think that is really the great part of being such a collective group of mm -hmm. folks who really are concerned about how we move our cities forward, but more importantly, how do we create evidence-based information to drive solutions. You know, I think about when I first became mayor and I said, you know, we have jobs. We have jobs in the city. But what has happened uh, with government, people no longer believe that government really can provide real solutions to their problems. And so, for example, we said, I said, well, you know what, instead of us waiting for people to come get the jobs, why don't we create a unit that goes out into the neighborhoods, out into the communities, and helps people to get jobs? And then just based on the results from the Work Baltimore program, we said, you know what, now we need to put a lawyer. So now we've got volunteer lawyers on those unit on that unit going out to the community, not only uh, providing them with jobs and opportunities, but also expunging records. Um, and so again, that evidence-based information really allows you to be as creative as you want to be, and again, to, to get the support that you need to make these things happen. So one of the things that, that Melody brought up in, in her remarks, and that comes through so beautifully in the, in the Stanford Social Innovation Review piece, is this, is this notion of really genuinely listening to the people that you're trying to serve, and, and again, marrying that with a, with a data approach. 
are there ways that, that data and community engagement have really come together? You mentioned engaging folks uh, with high level skills, but is there a way that, it, that it's also reaching out to maybe previously underserved communities? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, one of my um, nerd heroes uh, is Mitch Daniels. Uh, talk about him in my TED Talk, former OMB director, then he was governor of Indiana, now he's president at Purdue University. And one of the important things that he did at Purdue when he came in was enter into a partnership uh, with Gallup. And they created what they call the Gallup Purdue Index. And they went out and basically did a, a strong uh, survey of everyone that interacts with higher education at Purdue. So teachers, students, alums, parents, uh, administration. And through that analysis, they're able to get a handle on what are the most important things for people in the higher ed experience. And it's they did such a good job of it and continue to do such a good job of it that universities all around the country utilize Purdue's data on this. And so when we came in, we thought, we want to do the same thing for cities in Tulsa. And so we partnered with Gallup to create the Gallup City Voice Index. And they have been doing the analysis and the data collection. We're actually going to release the results in January. So I won't say a whole lot about it, but I will say, I mean, just one example. Uh, they found, and I think this is where it helps. In the past, I think if you were looking at what the citizens want, you'd end up with a broad generalization. Uh, in the, and we've done this in the past. Uh, you know, Previous mayors would do a citizen survey and hire their political pollster to go out and come back and tell us that everybody thinks the mayor is doing an awesome job. <laughs> uh, well, what we decided to do is, and, and what you we've received through this Gallup process is you get much more granular data, which you can then use to see what different communities within your city, how they relate to things. So one example would be trust in police. Uh, trust in police amongst white citizens in Tulsa is very, very high. Trust in police amongst African-American citizens in Tulsa is almost the inverse of that. Well, if we were doing a broad generalist, African-Americans in Tulsa make up about 8% of the population. So if we were just doing a broad survey, mm -hmm. we would never have found that. It would have been drowned out in the overall notion of the city. But because we've done this deep, done the work of doing a deeper dive, we can see that we have work to do in improving trust and community building and relationships between Tulsa's African American community and our police department. Uh, and I think that is one of those areas where we can better utilize data uh, to bring people together and understand the dynamics within a community better. Great. Mayor Pugh, you talked a little bit about how data gave you insight into a group that some folks would just sort of write off, the young men on the corner with the squeegee, and you were able to say, well, you know, this group of the men are, are well suited for more education, this for workforce, this for mental health. Are there other ways that data has helped you kind of have some insight into people that others might not respect or listen to or, or want to learn more about? So one of, one of the other things I did early on uh, as mayor was I realized that I said I can't do this work by myself. And so I did what I called a call to action and brought uh, folks into City Hall just to sit down and talk about problems that they were facing and and then to get groups to talk about what they thought should be done. And so again, everything is collected, information is shared, but more importantly, we were able to get them support for the work that they wanted to do. And so I found that the more inclusive you are and the more diverse you are, the better the solutions are. And oftentimes those folks are overlooked in terms of some of the things that they are doing. And I think I heard a young man say the other day, we've never been invited into City Hall before. Mm -hmm. And when you think about City Halls, I mean, these are our government buildings, they're public buildings, but we don't let people come in and share. While we will go out to neighborhood groups and organizations and so forth and tell folks what we're doing, but we're not listening enough. And we even, uh, one of my favorite things that we do is actually going out to the neighborhood uh, through a mediation group that came up, was a part of the call to action group. We do once, uh, I think it's twice a month, uh, we go out to the neighborhoods and communities and just do knock on the door listening tours so that we get to hear from the people what they want, what they're looking for, and then we collect the data and we go back to those neighborhoods, whether it is expungement services, job 
needs, health needs, drug addiction, drug treatment, all of those things, and to be able to take that data and go back to those neighborhoods and communities and provide the solutions that people are looking for. But these are driven by the comments of the neighborhoods and the, and the community people. Great. So we have time for one last question between us, and then we'll, uh, we'll go out to the audience. Um, and this is my favorite question to ask because I always get the best answers. But what is the, Mayor Pugh, what is the one thing that you think people here in this room and the folks who are watching this on the live stream, what's the one thing you want them to know about using data and evidence in government? The data supports uh, your solutions and that we should be collecting it. But we should be collecting it, but not just collecting it. We should be using it to drive sustainable solutions, solutions that are not momentary, solutions that don't you know, just work for the minute, uh, solutions that will change people's lives. And just one other thing, the reason we made Baltimore City Community College free, because it was based on the data that we collected as related to why they weren't going. And what we learned was that a percentage of the population, uh, the parents, could not fill out the FAFSA forms. 60% of the population mm -hmm. we knew could go to community college free anyway if they just filled out their FAFSA form. But collecting that data and then providing them with hubs all across the city to fill out those forms and to assist them in those efforts resulted in, instead of on an average 200 young people going to our Baltimore City Community College, nearly 600 going this past year. And then it also precipitated a, another local college in saying, you know what, if you finish there two years for free, you can come to Coppin State University. And Johns Hopkins, if you maintain a 4.0, you can come here. And Morgan State University and others providing opportunities for young people to go to college. Everybody doesn't have to, but at the same time, everybody ought to have the opportunity if they so desire. So that little bit of data has created this huge expansion of opportunity right. and engaged institutions in a real productive way. Yes. That's absolutely fascinating because we've had the exact same issue in Tulsa. And if Tulsa and Baltimore have the same problem, maybe we need to simplify the FAFSA form. Yes. Um, uh, I would say I think the great thing people need to understand about data is, and this was the incorrect understanding I had at first, it isn't about efficiency. It is about a, a vehicle by which you can bring a community together. Uh, Senator uh, Ben Sass has, it's probably the most important book I've read all year, uh, just came out, it's called Them. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about why we hate each other and how to heal is the subtitle of it. But he does an, an excellent job of outlining how all of these institutions that historically communities relied on to pull people of, of disparate values and opinions and life experiences together are declining in attendance. And it's never been easier to be isolated as a person. And so we have to come up with new ways of pulling communities together. And our experience in Tulsa is that utilizing data is a way that you can bring those people with very different life experiences, different presidential preferences, <laughs> uh, together to solve problems within your community. And it can be incredibly powerful in that way. Um, so now we have time for questions from the audience. Please wait for the mic. Yes, sir, you'll be the first one. Please wait for the mic to get to you so that we get good audio for the live stream. I hope I can uh, ask my question clearly and you can understand my communication with you. Um, my question is, first of all, I want to uh, thank Ms. Jennifer Bradley, Ms. Uh, Melody Barn, and Ms. Maya Jackimowicz. I hope I said that correctly. Uh, I wanted to thank you for uh, the uh, panel of mayors uh, sharing secrets transforming uh, local government. And my question is, uh, what type, that question is for uh, the mayor of Tesla, Oklahoma City. I don't want to mess up your name. <laughs> GT is good. Okay, thanks. Uh, what what first class uh, type of products does Tulsa make? By first class type, I mean like uh, manufactured, natural, or created uh, utilizing human interaction and development as a result of data collections. Okay. So you are asking what what do we produce? utilizing data 
as a city government or as a community? As a, as a community. I haven't been to Tulsa. You need to come to Tulsa. Okay. I'm thinking about it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, I mean, our, our core industries in Tulsa are, are energy and aerospace. Actually, the largest aerospace commercial maintenance facility in the world is in Tulsa for American Airlines. Anybody that flies on an American Airlines plane every six years that comes to Tulsa and is completely deconstructed and rebuilt. Um, and both of those have been very valuable for us in our work in data utilization because we already had data analysts that were working in those industries in the city that people from a nonprofit and governmental standpoint just weren't tapping into. And so when we were able to reach out to them and give them a chance to step away from their day job of working in aerospace or oil and gas or whatever it might be, to use that same skill set to better our city, they have come out in droves to do it. And I think that can apply regardless of the city you're talking about. Different cities have different economic sectors that they have specialization in, but the the private sector is just has been ahead of the public sector in bringing in people with data analysis skills and so that's the best place to go for the people that you can utilize as volunteers to make these impacts in your city you know a few years ago uh mayor De then deputy mayor bob Steele said that he had a realization that uh, every company in, in New York was a tech company, mm -hmm. whether yes. it was Macy's, whether it was the New York Times. And I think we're moving into a, yeah. a realm in which every company is also, if not a data analytics company, has that core competency exactly. for, for government to draw on. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, back there. So you, <clears throat> excuse me. So you both talked about using data and evidence to take money and focus it on things that work, taking it away from things that don't work. It's that taking it away from things that don't work is difficult. Uh, tell me how you got that done. By the way, that's a model question, right? It wasn't a speech, it was all done in one breath. So for future questions, just keep, keep that in mind. Uh, Mayor Pugh, do you wanna, do you wanna yeah, take that um, one? Part of us, uh, part of what we've done is not taking it away from things um, because you, you know, things are, are, are working in certain moderation. What we've done is, is partnered with the private sector to bring money in to solutions that we believe work based on data. And so for me, it's about public-private partnerships as well as, as um, engaging the philanthropic community as well. But we, in measuring success, you can eliminate, as we've done through the budget, budgetary process, things that aren't working. But you know, what we try to do is retool, you know, because there may be folks working in a certain area, uh, we retool those folks, you know, which is one of the things when leaving the Detroit City Labs we learned, uh, you were talking about education and, you know, what are you preparing your communities for? You know, like we look at Baltimore in terms of cybersecurity being the cybersecurity capital of the East Coast. We also look at it as the healthcare facility of the East Coast when you think about all the hospital systems. So the question becomes, how are you tooling your community to be prepared to take advantage of the growth industries in your community? So for us, it's how you start educating people at their youngest age to be able to take advantage of that. Great, Mayor Biden. I would say, uh, I think the notion of, and you're exactly right, that's where the fights come in is when you take resources away. And for us, we're still, you know, we're a year and 10 months into establishing our systems. And a lot of that has been around just having shared data pools that we can utilize and training our staff in how to utilize them. So I, I wouldn't say that I have a good example today of us literally taking it away from something. But similar to Mayor Pugh, what we have seen is the ability to identify those things that are not working that are in need of adjustment. So like a, a good example would be the Better Way program that I mentioned earlier. Since we're only six months into it, uh, we were able to recognize, well, here are some things that we're not we could be doing better on, and so we'll improve upon those. Animal welfare would be a good example. We utilize data to look at when were the calls for service coming in for stray and vicious dogs in Tulsa. And, and by the way, 
I, I could go down a <laughs> rabbit hole on this, but it's, it is fascinating no because the areas with the most challenged public health in Tulsa are also the areas where people walk around the, the least. But when we did, when we looked at the data around there and did a survey, what we found was it isn't because the people are lazy, it's because they're afraid to go out because there's more stray dogs in their neighborhood. They don't feel safe walking around their neighborhood. So animal welfare becomes a public health issue as well. Mm -hmm. But what we found was we were not staffing in line with when the calls for service were. We were nine to five Monday through Friday. Well, most people are at work Monday through Friday, nine to five, not walking around their neighborhood. The, the spike in calls for service come on Saturday and Sunday when we had no animal control officers out. So we realigned our staffing so that they are responding when those peak calls for service came in. Um, and so that is where, uh, at least so far, we've been able to utilize data to align resources in a way that responds and better serves uh, the citizens. And one last example uh, would be that uh, we we were getting complaints for years, and I imagine <laughs> most core cities run into this, which is our development community was saying, well, in the suburbs, it's just so much easier to develop. Right. It's a glacial pace in the core city, and but it was always anecdotal, and so our team installed a system where we could analyze how long does it actually take for a permit application to be processed? And what we found was the complaints were correct. I mean, the, the average time for a permit to be reviewed in Tulsa for the first time was five weeks, 25 working days, before someone ever even looks at it. And so I gave my state of the city address yesterday uh, and announced that we are, we look, we identified that, and then we also identified that the city had never, we hadn't updated our fees for permits in 13 years. <laughs> so we are going to update our fees to reflect 2018 prices, and by doing that, we can staff that department where the time for someone's permit application to be reviewed will go from five weeks to five days. Uh, that is where, at least so far, we're seeing utilizing data to improve performance is better. It's not so far, it hasn't been like shuttering a program, which is probably the most extreme example, but it has allowed us to modify the programs we have to better serve people. So one of the things we also asked all of our department heads, um, same point that you made, is to think of your city as a 24-hour city. Mm -hmm. The city's not 9 to 5. You know, police don't work 9 to 5. Fire department doesn't work 9 to 5. Why should... Why should picking up trash be nine to five? Mm -hmm. you know, or why should uh, answering the call of someone who's drug addicted be tw uh, nine to five? So one of the things we did in the health department was to create a stabilization center so there was a place 24 hours to go to. What our Department of Public Works said, you know what? I said, why are we fixing streets in the middle of the day? It just doesn't make sense. You know, why aren't we doing those overnight? Mm -hmm. So that one, you create visibility and light on the streets at night. Uh, not you know directly in neighborhoods, but especially on your main corridors. So now you have your department heads thinking about, so what can we do that's 24 hours? And so we're now compiling all of the things. In fact, the Department of Public Works put on an evening shift. But we're now compiling all of the ways that our departments can work 24 hours, not blow up the city's budget, but at the same time realign itself in such a way it meets the needs of the people. Great, so we have time for one more question. Um, actually, I'd like to. I'd like to hear from our, our friend and, and sir. We will get you, but I just want to make sure that we get our uh, friend from the Hispanic Caucus. So we're going to two more questions. So they're going to be. So they need to be short. Hi, good morning. My name is Jessica Lopez. I'm the Amazon Public Policy Fellow with CHCI. Thank you so much for being here. My question is regarding the human capital problem that Mayor Bynum actually mentioned. You said that your team is a team of three and that you rely on volunteers from the private sector. So how do you believe cities not need to start either enacting cultural change within city government to fully attract city employers, city Mm -hmm. employers to be city programmers and city data analysts? So we, uh, we have pursued that on two fronts. One is just identifying volunteers within the community who already have the skill set, who are willing to lend their time, and we've been very successful in that regard. The other is recognizing that there, are, and, and this is maybe a more long-term play, but we recognize that there are a lot of people in the community who would like to volunteer and help, or city employees who would like to help, who are not trained in data analysis. And so that's the other front that we've taken is we've developed a training program at the city 
where we work to train people who want to help in how to analyze data. And again, this is an example of where you can utilize your, like for us, it's a three-person office, but by going through taking the time to train other people in how to use data analysis, you're able to magnify the power and work capacity of that office many times. And then it also, it gives those employees a skill set that they did not have uh, before, uh, which can serve them better in any number of regards. And for volunteers within the community, it increases their capacity, not just to help the city, but also to help any number of organizations within our community. So in, in, in our office, um what we, we've encouraged in various departments, whether it is the police department, that you do have data, uh, data analysts and data scientists because what you'll find in the long run is that they do save you money mm -hmm. because it is about you know, being effective and driving folks towards it because it's a part of changing the culture. You know, um, I think that when Kendra would tell you that when she came into the office, I think she started out with two or three. I'm not sure how many people are now working in her office, but I can tell you that in the agencies, there are data scientists as well, because we need to drive um, data. You need data to drive solutions. And so it is, I mean, it is a field. It is, you know, it's like equity officers today. Mm. You know, companies and corporations are looking at equity officers to make sure that as you're looking across all of your spins, all of your hires, that you're being equitable and diverse. And so those will become a part, I think, of your um, data scientist office in terms of how you, you know, drive your city towards its greatness. So we look at all of that and looking forward to expanding that opportunity as well. And I do want, because it's something that I learned when I went through the fellowship program that is why we created this office, and I think it's so important, and I haven't mentioned it, so I want to. Uh, is it was drilled into my head that you don't have to have millions of dollars to start this work in your mm -hmm. city. Uh, you don't have to actually spend any additional money to do this work in your city. Uh, the, the office that we created, we pulled positions and their funding from within our organization sure. to pull this office together. Any city can do that and the value that it creates for your city then justifies both those positions being pulled from other places because it makes the other places more effective and efficient. But I think that so often, in, and I know we, we're as guilty of this as anybody, we think, well, if we're going to fix this one problem, we need to be committed to spending hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to do it. And the reality is to do this work, which can make you so much more effective and bring so many more people in your community into the life of the city government, you do not have to increase your overall city budget a dime. Yep, we didn't. So one last brief question and brief answers, because we are between all of you and lunch, and that, that, <laughs> that's not a sustainable place to be. <laughs> By way of preference, we, yes. if, if, yeah, if, if, you could, if you could keep the preface very short so we can yeah, just okay. get to well, the question. So I serve on the Financial Advisory Board of the City of Brockville, and we're currently working on a project to look at our performance measures that show up in the budget. So two questions. Okay, it's related. First is, is there a central registry of performance measures y'all have found useful that other people like us can go to and say, oh, well, we're trying to figure out, we'll look at street repairs, so here are some metrics that are good for that. Secondly, are there places you can find benchmarks against which you can compare yourself? Um, I know ICMA has a, a central main registry of key and performance. And that's, the, that's the International City and County Managers Association? Right. Yes. Yeah, sure. and they, following along at home. Yes, they have a, 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 an overall kind of standardized KPI uh, group that they utilize that, that then allows you to kind of do an apples to apples comparison city by city. The caution I would give to people though, and this was if there was one great uh, lesson amongst all others or above all others that we learned in our first two years of doing this work is that don't load your team down with 100 KPIs. Uh, think, determine what are the most important things for you to measure progress for your city government. Uh, and I'm talking about, you know, half a dozen to a dozen items that you can track because that then allows you to really drill down on how you're doing and delivering that performance. If you have, and we, and this is on me, we had way too many KPIs in my first two years as mayor and it disperses your focus. Uh, 
Right. Uh, so having a, a handful of them that you can really focus on is going to drive a lot more change than trying to cover everything that a city does. Okay. Yeah, I would just ditto that um, because you know we're focused on I think it's five different areas, mm -hmm. and um, those are the important things that we focus on, and that's where our data um, analysis office is set up. But I do think that every agency uh, inside of the government should have someone who's driving performance. Yep. Okay. So this has been, I think, a, a lively and engaging conversation. Um, I hope Melody's relative in Canada watches the whole live <laughs> and sees how completely engaging um, this, this subject is. And I think the one thing that, that we've managed to convey is that data is not the enemy of a human-centered and resident-focused government, but it's actually at the heart of it. Um, so thanks to all of you, and thanks again to our panel, our fellows, our speakers, and our co-hosts, Results from America. Thank you.